welcome to the connectivity session. Uh, Marta DeBarba and I uh, organize this as a sort of a symposium for the IBA conference. Thanks for the uh, organizing committee allowing us to uh, have this connectivity session. We got a, a great lineup of speakers from around the world. Uh, we got a few housekeeping uh, things to uh, discuss. Uh, the Zoom chat is uh, will be for moderators and speakers only. So I think uh, uh, among us speakers, if we Zoom chat, everybody doesn't see that. Attendees, uh, people listening out there, um, uh, you do your questions and answers through the attendee hub, the question and answer button, if that would be good. You can answer, we'll have our question and answer period at the end for 30 minutes. So type your questions in during people's talks as you think of them, and then we will look at them and bring them up to the discussion uh, to the participants. And I think that's the housekeeping. Let's get started. Uh, our first talker is an invited speaker. It's uh, Gary Tabor, he was trained as a veterinarian and ecologist based out of Bozeman, Montana. He's been working on large landscape connectivity for as many years as I've been alive. Or no, I'm, I'm not 35, am I? And, um, but, but for 35 years, uh, he's also the chair of the IUCN Connectivity Specialist Group. Uh, he's a founder and leader of a vibrant and very effective NGO, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Uh, they blend science, community resilience, policy, law, partnerships across the world to foster ecological community. He's a world leader in connectivity thinking and infectiously enthusiastic on this topic is quite inspiring. And so for that, I'll hand it over to you, Gary, share your screen and unmute your uh, speaker. Thank you, Mike. Can you all see it? Can I get an affirmation? Perfect. Thank you all for inviting me. This is the first time um, I get to speak at IBA. I know a lot of bear biologists from around the world, so I'm really thrilled to be here. And um, let's see if I can advance my screen. Oh, my screen is not, adv uh, not advancing. Uh, there we are. So as we begin, uh, I'd like to dedicate this talk to a colleague of mine who was an IBA member, John Bevins. And we spent two great summers in Alaska in 1985 and 86. And he taught me Gary Larson art and how to fly fish. Um, tragically, he died looking for polar bears um, in, in 1990. Um, but I, you know, my early years in connectivity wasn't with Alaska Fish and Game as an intern and becoming a wildlife veterinarian taught me a lot about wildlife. And I did a lot of work, work with bears at that time. I then moved to Africa. Um, I then moved to Africa um, where I got to be involved with great apes, another animal that's not a bear, but is as hairy as a bear, um, in Kibale National Park, where I spent uh, many years, almost eight years in Africa, and helped save this forest from being destroyed to becoming a national park. That led to working in other national parks. Uh, in that part of Africa, it's called the Albertine Rift, working on chimpanzees and gorillas, and even trying to save high Afro-Montane environments. And what you'll see is that the Albertine Rift is an ecological network, parks connected, and that's where I essentially got inspired to look at connectivity at a large scale. When I came back from Africa to the US, I, I met a, a great bunch of Canadian and American conservation scientists led by Harvey Locke and Reed Noss, who introduced me to the Yellowstone to Yukon concept. And I wrote the first strategic plan for the Yellowstone to Yukon effort, and then um, created an investment strategy for this large scale connected network of parks, 700 protected areas, starting in 19, even though the, the, um, the initiative began in 1994, I essentially helped start implementing the initiative in 1995. I married an Australian and then suddenly you start seeing a pattern here. I began in an African uh, ecological network. I emigrated to a North American ecological network and then I married into an Australian ecological network. And so the pattern of connectivity started to make sense to me across, across the world. And this is really relevant, you know, this is not the exception, although these are well-known connected networks, they're really not the exception, they're, they're becoming the rule. 
we're living in an increasingly fragmented planet. More than 50% of the planet is human dominated. And a lot of it is started by roads and rails and pipelines. They're the tip of the spear to fragmentation. And every road and rail that you know now will double in the next 25 years. And especially with COVID and economic stimulus packages, we're gonna see a lot of um, areas where roads have never been placed before going in. In fact, the world's becoming so fragmented, many mammal species can't even complete their life cycle. They don't have room to roam. They can't find food, shelter, mates, dispersal. And then we have to wonder why are we in a biodiversity crisis? And the sad part of fragmentation is that people don't even connect the dots. That the fragmentation in Southeast Asia led to the outbreak of coronavirus, which we're now suffering around the world. And so the economic and social consequences of this ecological disaster are apparent every day. Too many lives have been lost. Too many species have, are being threatened. And here is a map of the high biodiversity areas of, South, of, of East and Southeast Asia. And these are the proposed new major infrastructure areas that are gonna be uh, popped in in the years to come. And many in areas that have never seen a road or rail or learning infrastructure bef before. A lot of it being driven by the Belt and Road Initiative the mega um, investment project driven by the Chinese economy in all parts of the world, both in marine and, and terrestrial areas. And so fragmentation has gotten so bad around the world that even the ag sector is now very concerned about the loss because it is the underpinning of great soil, of pollination, of all the elements that create sustainable agriculture. So the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the largest 200 multinational companies in the world say, hey, you know, let's pay attention to this. This is really an important issue for conservation. So what I've been trying to do with many others is because this is an emergent field of science. Yes, it's been around for about 60 years or so, but its application is really new. So how do we kind of standardize this, standardize this so we can have consistent practice and also consistent measures so we can do better at this? So ecological connectivity conservation recently has now a standard definition as the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on earth. And for those, what's a natural process flow? Well, anyone who works on gravel bed rivers in the Flathead Basin will know why it is that it's not only just living things that move, but also there are movements of physical processes that are important for the connection of species and habitats and life. I also I tend to think of connectivity as the circulatory system of nature. If protected areas, parks, and are, are the heart and lungs of, of conservation, well, they can only be sustained by a circulatory system. And that's what connectivity conservation is. And here's the uh, Waterton Glacier International Peace Park right here. It's really a, truly a heart in the middle of the Yellowstone to Yukon landscape. And as you can see, we can map out the connectivity for grasslands or shrublands, you know, that, that are related to what's going on in the protected area. And that's why conservation in the 21st century has all to do with not only what's going on in the protected areas, but what's going on outside known as the matrix. I can't say this more, more than enough. Conservation happens on all lands and seas. The biosphere works is because the cumulative impact of all the conservation we do across all lands and seas add up to a functional biosphere. And for a lot of folks, connectivity is just about wildlife movement. But I've pointed out here on the left, all the other services that are attributed to, to enhancing connectivity conservation. And of course, connectivity is one of the few areas that combine the biodiversity or connect the biodiversity agenda with the climate change agenda as species move, but not only as species move to new environmental conditions, how habitat moves, how conditions change, how essentially the canvas for conservation is changing underneath, is changing underneath us. And people think of connectivity, and I know all you bear biologists out there, we're all terrestrial focused, 
um, except for the polar bear folks. Um, we know that there's a lot of connectivity. In fact, the marine biologists will say there's more connectivity in the marine space because of the 3D environment in the marine space than there is in the terrestrial realm. And anyone who's working on free flowing rivers in the world will tell you how threatened many of the rivers of the world are because of lack of connectivity. So basically more connected is better connected. Um, that's, as, that's as simple as it gets. And, you know, but we wanted to figure out where this practice is going. So several years ago, colleagues and I, we did a survey of 550 connectivity plans from around the world for the past 30 years. We had an effective size of 263 plans and we wanted to see what's the state of connectivity planning? Where is the science going in terms of implementation? And what we see is that in all continents, and although North America is leading, in all continents, it's rising exponentially since the millennium. So somehow connectivity has now gotten to become kind of a marginal uh, effort of conservation to becoming a mainstream effort of conservation. And that's kind of recently reflected in an additional study that was carried out in Canada, which was just looking at connectivity activity uh, just in the Canadian realm. And it, it follows our pattern that we are seeing globally. So for all you Canadians, it's really British Columbia and Alberta that are leading in terms of connectivity conservation work. Our paper showed, and you can, you can read it, the 10 points that make for a successful implementation of a connectivity plan. I thought the funniest outcome was is that if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. So if you create a plan, please be specific about what you want to ask for. Otherwise, you know, no one's going to get, no one can guess what your outcome is. But one of the key outcomes was having enabling policy. And just in this past year, this pandemic year, we've seen some remarkable advances in connectivity conservation policy. The first UN unanimous resolution, UN General Assembly saying, hey, connectivity matters. Nature knows no borders. That's a big deal. Um, the G7, uh, the major economic countries around the world put out a statement that any protected area system has to have, that has to be well connected. Various countries around the world now have national policies for connectivity. Even Canada is discussing it, has a whole working group as part of its pathway to target one process. In the past three years, 18 US states have come up with state wildlife corridor or connectivity policies. And we're even, even our House of Representatives passed the National Wildlife Corridor Act. And Texas, the worst poorly planned state in, in, in North America, Houston, the worst poorly planned city in North America, even has now a connectivity policy where they're looking at connectivity as part of its resilience to rising sea levels from the Gulf of Mexico. So the world is now looking more ambitiously about conservation. We hear about half Earth saving half the planet, the IUCN, uh, the recent uh, Motion 101 from IUCN, the World Conservation Congress, calling for half the planet to be saved and using the 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the planet by the year 2030 as a goal, as a benchmark. But I just want to point out that a lot of this has to do with the Convention of Biological Diversity and the ACHI Target 11, which essentially sets a target for conservation, it has been 70% terrestrial, 10% for coastal and marine, and now that's all going up to 30. But here it is, here are all the protected areas now mapped on a blue oceanic background. And we can increase their size, but we still have a problem. They're not connected. And in fact, less than 10% of the world's protected areas are connected. And more, better, you know, more connection is more effective protected area systems. Michelle Ward and colleagues came out um, in uh, last year and, so, you know, and did the mapping and said that you know, less than 10% of the world was connected. And what we need is we don't have a 30 by 30 target for connectivity and we need that. So for all of you, you know, in this session, we need help. We need to come up with a high level connectivity metric that the world can embrace at the policy level. So what would that look like? Essentially, what are you gonna call this line? We want protected areas around the world to not only increase in protected area size, but increase in their connectivity as well. And that's what that green line represents. What do we call that green line? Well, 
maybe that's the, the game we can play uh, as part of uh, looking at thinking back on my talk. So as this century movement of connectivity conservation has risen around the world, four years ago at the previous World Conservation Congress, IUCN created the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. And we were about 500 members in about 50 countries at that time. And now we're over 1,000 members in 125 countries. It's, it's becoming a, a, a it, it shows the mainstreaming of connectivity conservation. And what we do as part of the specialist group and then every language, every culture, we're trying to express the importance that connectivity is the safety net for nature. It's the connections, it's the flows, all of this matters. It's really the processes that make up conservation. One of the key outcomes that we've had in our four years was creating the first global guidance for connectivity conservation through ecological corridors and ecological networks. I wanna thank all my co-authors led by Jody Hilty and Graham Warboys and Stephen Woodley and Annika Keeley. But it was a global effort. And many of you um, who are probably on this meeting were involved in some fashion, some co consultation. We went to ev almost every continent. We had 16 authors. Um, we had thousands and thousands of comments. Um, I lost, that's how I lost all my hair. Um, but let me just briefly like run through the key highlights of, of these guidelines. First, we just had to, in one place, show why connectivity was needed. We had to show the scientific history, the whole basis of connectivity, beginning with island biogeography and metapopulation theory and, and all the science that has evolved. We even created, worked with uh, um, Michigan State University to create a website of all the evolving science in connectivity conservation. It's, it's a tsunami of science for all species, all taxon um, um, and community ecology around the world. And we wanted to create a repository for this. So I encourage you to look at Conservation Corridor if you haven't. It's supported by our National Science Foundation because we wanna make sure that connectivity conservation is grounded in the most recent and most up-to-date science as possible. We even work with groups that are trying to continue to refine the effectiveness of connectivity for many, many years until essentially um, the Savannah River project um, um, led by uh, Nick Haddad and all. And um, we really didn't have like much empirical proof. We did have much functional connectivity work with animal movements, but in terms of having a, a deep empirical data sets, those have just recently come out in the last couple of decades. And it's now being continued by Paul Beyer with this effort called docorridorswork.com. It's a whole website. You can see what they're doing, trying to look at this in various parts of the world. But one of the key pro issues with connectivity conservation is that there were terms all over the place. And so we had to crosswalk all the terms uh, in this field. I mean, here are just some in the English language, let alone other languages some of the uh, terminology that we had to address, biological corridor, climate corridor, permeability zone, linkage zones. Um, in fact, you know, the lexicon was, was confusing. So we had to create essentially a hierarchy of, of, of terminology and a crosswalk. We came up with the, with the two definitions, one I've given you earlier, about the unimpeded movement of species and flow of natural processes. The scientists wanted a more um, defined uh, definition. So we have a policy definition and a scientific definition, a scientific definition dealing with gametes and propagules and things that scientists love, but no policymaker could under doesn't really understand. But then I go back to Mike Proctor, who, who really said it all when connectivity is really six across the highway. So we also had to like, you know, go with like, what's what, what's, a, you know, what's no connectivity? What's a corridor? What's a crossing? What's an ecological network? So, you know, to essentially discuss the building blocks and the, and the cluster of what connectivity conservation constitutes. So here's the big tape home point with regards to our guidelines. While protected areas and these new conserved areas also called other effective conservation measures, and someone please define these in, in real life, um, are, are set to be truly protecting, protecting biodiversity at all levels, nature first. 
but ecological corridors don't have to do that. They can be seasonal, temporal. They can be spatial. They can spatially change. They they're not a protected area, but they are. They complement a protected area. So they can protect biodiversity, but they don't have to. But they must protect connectivity. They usually work because there's been some enabling policy for um, corridors, because often if they're not protected areas, then they have to have some kind of legal de designation that ne is not necessarily related to a protected area. And if you look at it, they have to add up to um, ecological networks. And while this conceptual model shows linear areas between protected areas across realms, marine, terrestrial, freshwater, uh, they could be of any size, any width. Um, it, the, basically, it's their, you know, their human and wildlife or human nature compatibility zones that are enshrined in some type of policy. World Wildlife Fund has an effort, Prachi is going to talk to you later about Wildlife Connect, you know, about saving ecological networks around the world, because this is what big, large scale conservation is going to be. Like the three networks I showed you before. This is how connectivity conservation and having these enabling corridors add up to create these um, ecological networks. So because we were dealing with essentially a new type of protection, we had to lay out the various strategies for protecting corridors, you know, land covenants, uh, conservation easements, voluntary agreements. Um, there, there's a whole list of ways of essentially protecting private lands enshrined for either termed discrete time periods or for perpetuity. And what we also had to mention is that connectivity crosses all realms. You know, we can't be in these silos of the marine people not talking to the terrestrial people, not talking to the folks who look, who look up into the airspaces. And that connectivity had to be integrated into all the major um, multilateral environmental agreements that are happening at, for this decade, the 2020 to 2030 decade, including the climate change uh, agenda. And then once we have these corridors and they are spatially explicitly and they're spatially designated, well, where are we gonna put that information? So the World uh, Conservation Monitoring Center is now creating a new database for area-based commitments. They have the database for protected areas but we also have to have a database for all these kind of corridors that are not protected areas, but are committed. And they're called area-based commitments. And then we're creating this new data set. But in the meantime, in places around the world, like in India, all the, many of the NGOs are working together to create national databases for connectivity, such as the Coalition for Wildlife Corridors. But you know, we're not finished just protecting areas. We have to stop the process of fragmentation. And so now that we've gotten the guidelines out, our next guidance has to deal with how do we deal with the road, rail, linear infrastructure issue? We've got to be smarter about road. We have to avoid them in high biodiversity places, and we have to be smarter in how we build them. And we have to mitigate all the damage that we've done around the world. We need green infrastructure for linear infrastructure. Because everyone looks at roads and they just think that's the impact right there, but roads have a profound impact, as many of you know, way beyond the, the road itself. And here's the thing that, that Joachim Jaeger at Concordia University struck me with, is that he had a grad student who just looked at the base number. And the base number for large wild mammals around the world, every year, every year, 100 million are killed through wildlife vehicle collisions. The biodiversity loss, the biomass loss to that is staggering. And this is not just, you know, the common species. These are sometimes rare and uncommon species, like in Tasmania, where they lose about 500 Tasmanian devils every year to road collisions. And so many of us see the road, but not the forest. And I have to keep reminding folks that this simple, you know, internet meme is that, you know, the animal isn't crossing the road, the road is crossing the forest. So linear infrastructure and connectivity conservation are rising. And I just wanna point out that there's been a whole Asia study done by USAID. And, in, and especially for anyone in uh, the Asian realm, you may find this set of webinars and seminars very interesting to you. And you can contact me more for information. But basically the ecological networks that I began with my career 
are growing in size and space all around the world. It's because we are trying to combat this mega problem of fragmentation. Bear biologists have led the way with all the work you've done with your field work and with your understanding of bear movements. You have created this network, many of these networks around the world that are essentially examples for connectivity conservation. And as we rise with all these efforts, maybe we can combat and overcome the fragmentation that's tearing apart our biosphere. Because the way we're gonna save nature is by connecting all these large landscape and seascape efforts. We're gonna save the planet by connecting one large landscape and seascape at a time. I really wanna thank you all for inviting me. Uh, for those who wanna know more about the guidelines, here's some information. I wanna thank my co-authors who helped write those guidelines. And I wanna thank IBA for inviting me. And again, thank you for all that you do. Okay, thanks Gary. And now we'll move on to the next speaker. Can you guys hear me, I guess? Can you give me a mic? Yeah, okay, awesome. Next speaker, it's my great pleasure to present him is Mike Proctor. And um, I'm very happy to present him because I know Mike since many years and it started all back when I was doing my PhD um, out of the University of Idaho and I drove up to BC several times um, uh, to talk science and also with him and also dream about future projects often over uh, a glass of whiskey and piano lessons at his home in, in Caslo. So it was a lot of fun, but I also learned a lot from him. And Mike started um, working on connectivity back in 98, and that's also when he started his PhD. And in fact, this is one of the many crazy things that he's done in, in his life, you know, starting a PhD at, at 50. Um, and uh, he has been working on um, connectivity um, issues in, in southern Canada since then, but um, most recently he has expanded uh, from working on grizzly bear connectivity to into ecological corridors that encompass broader components of the natural world. And there you go, Mike. Uh, are we good? Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, also, thank you very much for your invited talk, Gary. I realize I'm giving the wrong talk today. I should be giving my ecological corridor talk. It's uh, limited to the very last sentence of my talk today, but uh, anyway, it's been very, uh, very inspiring talk, from Gary. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, still take us around the world a little bit. This is sort of a uh, complicated talk in the sense that I'm not presenting any data, but I'm summarizing uh, a chapter we wrote for Bears of the World about connectivity. And uh, all of the co-authors were, uh, and some of the speakers today were those uh, participants. And um, so it's a bit of a, what, you know, one of the issues of the pandemic is we haven't been able to travel. I've actually really appreciated that. I've traveled way too much in the last few years, but uh, it did, uh, one of the downsides, we didn't get to travel to Kalispell and that bit of a, uh, too bad, but this trip is gonna be a bit of a travel log. It's like a little aerial view of the earth. So hang on, sometimes a window in this plane will be open a little bit. We're gonna start uh, with a view of your Asia and get a sense, uh, I'm gonna try to link up uh, bear biology and where we are in the uh, status of conservation science and how and I want you all to think about how we can improve that into Gary's very bigger world of ecological corridors but we're going to look at brown bears the map that Bruce McClellan and Juro and uh, Stephen Michelle and, and I built about uh, for the IUCN red list uh, we're looking at the you can see the fragmentation of the bears in their southern distribution much more uh, intense than the uh, north, uh, they're of least concern. We look at pandas, which we'll talk about a little later, but they're a small distribution, highly fragmented. They're vulnerable. Uh, sloth bears is fragmented across India and uh, uh, that subcontinent, they're also vulnerable. Uh, sun bears are uh, broken up across Southeast Asia. They're also vulnerable on the IUCN red list. And Asiatic black bears span the uh, overlap brown bears and uh, sun bears in Southeast Asia. They're also vulnerable. And then not to forget the Andean bears, also vulnerable. 
and it's uh, got a disjointed uh, distribution across uh, South America. The, the upshot of this is that that common theme is extensive fragmentation of subpopulations of various intensities and complexities. It's very complex, uh, variable, and serious uh, situation for bears ar around the world. Uh, all species sort of have this, um, this theme about them. Of course, polar bears are fragmented naturally. We're not gonna deal with them today, but have a circumpolar navigation, but they're not human in, uh, fragmented, but they, they have uh, various uh, things. But well, that's another story. So we're gonna look a little closer at brown bears, which are pretty much circumpolar distribution, uh, at least around the Northern hemisphere. And when you look closer at them, the Southern uh, distribution is what's really fragmented in a pretty serious way. And when we uh, assessed them for the red list, we made a, we did a population by population assessment because of that fragmentation. Some of them are critically endangered and, and, and endangered and vulnerable. Uh, and it's a pretty serious situation. And there's been uh, a few instances of some good science and implied, uh, uh, applied strategic management where we've seen some increases uh, in, uh, in connectivity. And uh, Alexander Kopass will be talking about that a little later in a subsequent session. Um, uh, in North America, there's been, uh, it's not nearly as uh, intensely fragmented, but the Southern distribution is fragmented. And there's been Quite a bit of science uh, identifying that, uh, we, uh, identifying corridors in the transborder area and the reminiscing Frank's talk yesterday and Cecily about the NCD and Yellowstone, they've done some corridor identification between those populations and on the Southwest British Columbia, Michelle McClellan's done some good connectivity work uh, over there. Uh, we've done some decent science. Just gonna explore a little closer the transborder area where the population has sort of uh, evolved or devolved into a metapopulation of sorts, uh, basically a female fragmented system. And the uh, male, uh, males are sort of overeager expandable sperm packets mediating genetic connectivity in that region. And uh, the small, uh, so we look to female driven connectivity in that, uh, in that region. Uh, it's a much more urgent issue, more, pro uh, more problematic. But um, I'm just gonna zero in on uh, this one population in Southern Selkirk, so spans US-Canada border, has been um, completely isolated for uh, you know, several decades. And we went in and did some uh, GPS telemetry-based uh, corridor modeling and identified corridors and uh, applied uh, some kind of, I wanted to see if we could reconnect this isolated bear population. So we applied 10 years of connectivity management and measurably improved the connectivity in that region. So it did work, we, we could do it. We're not gonna go into the details, but we published a paper about how we actually sort of helped that, that system. Um, on Moving on in my 12 minutes, uh, we're on to black bears uh, in North America. You can see a similar uh, pattern, uh, Southern distribution is fragmented. And there's been some uh, good work in Florida about uh, good connectivity science and implement, implemented management and increased connectivity by Dixon et al. And then there's been uh, sort of natural and human assisted connectivity for recolonization in several populations around the, uh, the, bear, pop, uh, the bear sphere, the black bear sphere uh, in the, there for Andean bears. Uh, creation of uh, protected areas is one of the tools they're using to uh, reconnect uh, some of the core habitats. There's been a little bit of uh, corridor identification underway, mainly using habitat-based models rather than the direct telemetry or DNA at this point. Uh, there's been some good work by these authors. And uh, panda bears, which we're gonna hear about in much more detail a little bit later, uh, has been divided up into 33 subpopulations, some with uh, not just jurisdictional, but some with some very small numbers of bears. Uh, and even though panda conservation has been improving recently, uh, there is some uh, efforts to enhance connectivity, may possibly create a national park uh, with a system of corridors. So it's entered in the panda world uh, as well. Um, uh, we're going to hear more about sloth bears from several authors later. Uh, but you know, 1.2 billion people living with sloth bears in India, the dense humanity and forest conversion is uh, creating patchy habitats. There's growing corridor research by some of our speakers, uh, but there's plenty of habitat outside of protected areas. Uh, and that uh, allows for some potential for connectivity. Uh, and also it suggests that they might be an umbrella species uh, beyond tigers and elephants in these regions. The tigers and elephants dominate conservation scene in these areas, but other er uh, this might also be important for some of the other unprotected areas. Uh, 
And here they uh, focus on conserving existing corridors. It's hard to uh, reestablish a corridor here, but, but uh, maintaining the current ones become important. Uh, Asiatic black bears. Uh, wanted to point out some pretty cool studies. There's a people in uh, Iran doing some very creative work with uh, using sign and cameras and sightings, no high tech telemetry and DNA to develop habitat based uh, corridor, uh, core habitats and core, uh, uh, excuse me, connected with core habitat models. Some very creative stuff by some Iranians. I'm pretty impressive in that environment there, pulling together some good science. And Vaikau is uh, doing some actual uh, DNA surveying and some genetic work in, in Thailand to understand corridor uh, work for bears there too. Um, and uh, sun bear is a species with the least uh, uh, research. There's been some work done by Scottson. She's using habitat forest variables as a surrogate for connectivity across the entire distribution. And Kunde is uh, uh, using some genetic data. Uh, but uh, again, there's some plenty of forest habit, uh, sun bear habitat outside of protected areas, providing hope for connectivity in the region. And uh, it's kind of, so um, it's going to briefly look at some of the causes, which, which really are global in scope for bears, um, even though they're complete different cultures and, and species. Uh, some of the patterns are the same. Callus bell, yesterday we heard, um, saw Mark Boyce, or excuse me, uh, Rick Mace's uh, red line between the mountains and the Callus bell. That's, uh, that's where we are all in our heads at this conference right now. But a similar thing occurs in Asia with agriculture and human settlement. The mountains are separated and the human settlement uh, fragments uh, uh, bear populations as, oops, as do transportation corridors everywhere. And then probably the biggest threat to uh, connectivity of bears and, and a lot of uh, large carnivores and just large, uh, uh, much of terrestrial habitats is just bear, human bear conflicts where we kill uh, bears over, over decades that, that create uh, dead, dead zones, if you will. You can see that it happens, in, the similar thing happens in Canada as happens in China. Houses break into homes to get to food, and then they end up dead. Uh, habitat loss and degradation, of course, is also a, a serious concern out there. Uh, some of the methods that have, are used across the, uh, the earth uh, to assess these are all, span everything from expert opinion up to direct genetic analyses. Uh, you can, you know, we I mentioned habitat modeling is being used in the Andes. Uh, Telemetry is not used quite so much, but indirect genetic analyses can be important. You can see the Gobi bear population there in Central Asia has got a heterozygosity of 48, and the adjacent Russian population has a heterozygosity of 80. It's an indication that those Gobi bears are uh, isolated, and it's an indirect measure. Another direct measure we use, if you get uh, a little more detailed with uh, better genetic sampling and a uh, high number of loci, you can do individually based, in that uh, in that frame, you can see uh, uh, two isolated, uh, isolated population in the red and the white, but we, we can use this to show how it's isolated, but we're also using it to show the migrants that we've uh, identified through uh, management. Uh, it's a pretty uh, powerful technique to show the um, times. Uh, so the uh, methods we're using uh, uh, for quarter identification, we can use any input method, uh, telemetry, DNA, cameras, or sign to build a habitat model and then build a resistance corridor model. These are being used in various uh, uh, channels across the world. Um, and um, some of the uh, connectivity recovery management techniques, a big one is reducing conflicts, but more important is uh, programs that include people's needs and bears needs, uh, highway structures, official corridor manage, uh, establishment as Gary mentioned, uh, habitat protections that leave uh, and restore forested connections and improved People bear management, we've been very good at there at Canada. Uh, uh, managing people, as you can see, especially if you're a moose, you can manage uh, some Canadians uh, very effectively. And also recolonization programs, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, it's gonna, uh, some of the challenges, uh, developing uh, political will, even though Gary indicated it's occurring, it's still challenging in my region to get political will to manage for connectivity. Uh, and corridors can compete with people for lowland habitats and increase uh, the risk of conflicts with bears and sometimes they're not quite so popular. And um, identifying corridors where connectivity is feasible important is very important and we need to understand where bears can use degraded habitats that might act as corridors. Uh, and of course, identifying culturally specific solutions around the world. I'm gonna leave you with just a couple of comments. Uh, 
you know, from my scan of the world, connectivity can increase and it can be done. We can make progress. And there are some reasons to dance about this. Uh, and it can't be ignored, as Gary made very abundantly clear, it's much bigger than bears. A small isolated population, the habitat patches are increasing everywhere. And I'd like to encourage you, this is my last uh, idea that relates back to Gary, but uh, consider multiple species and corridors that broaden your support and your biological benefit and increase your funding potential. When I blew up my bear corridors to ecological corridors, I increased my funding potential by tenfold. It was very amazing what I could get done. Uh, and it's been a nice way to link uh, bears to that larger world. And I'm over time, I apologize and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's figure out where we are in the world. Do my technology, excuse me. There we go. And I'm still on screen here. Sorry, everyone, for hearing me too much. I'm going to introduce uh, our next speaker. And um, that is uh, Dr. Ron Swaysgood. He uh, serves at the San Diego Zoo. Uh, as an endowed director of re recovery ecology, he oversees uh, several species conservation programs locally in Southern California and around the globe. It's hard to keep track of uh, Ron. He's off, uh, he conducts research on uh, species recovery of a variety of taxa ranging from frogs to rhinoceros, but particularly bear species. He's a co-chair of the IC IUCN Bear Specialist Group, Panda. Uh, expert team and coordinator of the Giant Panda Species Survival Fund. Uh, and he's a, a, a very effective world ecologist and we're pleased to have him talk about pandas today. Thank you, Ron, go ahead. Well, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it and the invitation to be here. I'll start sharing my screen. Um, oops, not with the conclusions, hopefully. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, it would be great for us all to be together in, in Montana where we could uh, chat about things, but I guess we're all saving our carbon footprint, so that's a good thing as well. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to follow these two uh, great talks on connectivity, and uh, we're going to um, drill down a little bit more and look at the connectivity and population fragmentation in the giant panda. So before we move into issues of connectivity, we need to talk a little bit about um, the uh, conservation background and status. Um, as I think we all know, the, uh, the panda is sort of the icon of endangerment, you know, of endangered species. Um, and for a couple of decades was assessed by IUCN to be endangered. Um, in 2016, however, we were able to downlist the, the panda from endangered to, to vulnerable using the IUCN criteria. Uh, China has, uh, the Chinese government uh, has also since downlisted the panda to vulnerable. And we'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, one of the overriding factors is uh, China is one of the few countries on the planet that actually has, has been experiencing increased forest cover. And along with that increase comes uh, more panda habitat. Um, and as you can see here, uh, uh, th this is results from Chinese, uh, China's national survey they do uh, throughout the Panda Range. And we can see that the, uh, the, the area of occupancy has been starting to creep upward across these uh, sur surveys, which happen about every 10 years or so. And then we also know that the population is increasing. And of course, um, here on the right, you can see this is uh, what makes the panda so charismatic, although we, you rarely see them in the wild because of the uh, dense bamboo forest they live in, they do leave about 48 of these droppings per day on average. So they leave this perfect track record of, of, their, uh, of where they are. And uh, there's lots of other great information in these little panda poo packets. But what we know from these uh, fecal surveys primarily um, is this change in population we see here. And of course, if we could go back earlier, it'd be exponentially higher, um, but the panda population was crashing and then slowly stopped and began to recover. So the panda trend is positive. Um, so how did this happen? Um, uh, a lot of things happened, but um, 
several of these actions by the Chinese government um, have got us uh, where we are today. Uh, um, to address the poaching problem, they banned, they banned poaching. They made it a, a capital offense at one time, actually. Um, and they also, uh, the Chinese government also, to address habitat loss and degradation, has established uh, 67 uh, nature reserves for pandas to address the loss of forest cover um, um, and, and also provide ecosystem services throughout China. They started the National Forest Protection Program, which is a ban on logging uh, to increase the forest cover. Um, they started the Grain to Green Project, which is a, a, a massive eco-compensation program to convert agricultural land back to forest. And um, we'll just skip over habitat fragmentation and population subdivision because we're going to take a little bit deeper dive, but they are have been addressing connectivity issues for a while. But then also um, to, for adaptive management needs, um, they have this uh, national survey that really helps inform us what's going on with the population and the habitat. So, so what's the problem? Well, I think this, this uh, figure illustrates what the problem is. Um, the other bear species um, have typically um, larger populations than giant pandas, but they're decreasing. And pandas are the reverse. They have smaller populations that are increasing. So that's why they have the same status, which is vulnerable. But here you can see, uh, this is the, the blue line is the historical range. And uh, the red dots are <laughs> little squigglies are the current um, distribution of giant pandas. So they've lost uh, most of their range. So if we um, zoom in on, on this, we can see here that uh, the Existing panda occupied panda habitat is highly fragmented. Um, it occurs in these uh, uh, six mountain ranges, including Mingshan, um, uh, Chung. Um, well, they don't need, you can read those. It's, uh, the picture of you guys is blocking this. So, um, <laughs> so anyhow, um, we can see there's a real need for some some connectivity uh, throughout um, their distribution. Um, so indeed, habitat fragmentation has been identified as one of the, um, uh, or as identified as, as the primary threat um, facing giant pandas during our assessment um, in, I'm going to minimize that, during, during our assessment in, uh, in 2016 for the IUCN Red List. Um, there are about 33 subpopulations, um, although they're not necessarily all of them in uh, biological subpopulations. The largest one um, is about 400 individuals, and um, about 18 of these subpopulations contain fewer than 10 pandas. So we can look at also um, genetic connectivity. Again, uh, there's uh, this gold mine of information about pandas um, from their uh, these fecal surveys, which contain lots of good things, um, including DNA. And so from this, we can look at issues of connectivity. And um, there have been identified um, three distinct genetic clusters um, or should be management uh, units. And um, we also can see uh, you know, the pattern of gene flow across the landscape, across various barriers that you know, some more or less permeable. Um, and those barriers are, include natural barriers such as rivers but also increasingly anthropogenic barriers, which uh, roads are a large problem. Um, and of course, any area that's been deforested for agriculture or urban development. And more worrisome perhaps is that, you know, despite the efforts to conserve panda habitat, is that climate change is forecast to exacerbate um, these connectivity issues. So there are a number of, of measures that are specifically um, designed to increase connectivity for pandas. Um, uh, one of those, of course, is, is the increase in the number of protected areas. Um, we have about 67 uh, panda reserves uh, covering about 3 million hectares. And that's about 54% of uh, suitable habitat and 67% of the panda population that falls within that umbrella of protection. We also know that um, the protected area management is effective um, up to a point. Uh, we know that uh, uh, pandas are doing better inside than outside um, protected areas and their habitat is better conserved. 
There are, however, issues with the management that need to be improved, um, which include a lot of uh, human disturbance issues, such as livestock, livestock grazing in some of the protected areas. Um, and then, you know, the National Forest Conservation Program or logging ban and the grain to green program to restore forest um, are actually fantastic tools for increasing connectivity. Uh, those again are eco, eco compensation uh, programs. And so they, they incentivize protection and, and restoration of panda habitat um, even outside of protected areas, which of course helps um, connect them. Um, and so there's also, uh, of course, been work designed to um, design and test uh, uh, corridors. Uh, in some cases, there's been measurement of panda use of the corridors and the habitat features which encourage uh, corridor use. And in the absence of uh, landscape connectivity, in some cases, uh, translocation has been used as a tool to, to establish some connectivity um, uh, that's been included wild sourced pandas that are relocated as well as released from the captive breeding program. Um, and this, this tool is implemented particularly in the southern end of the range where um, the populations are much smaller and more highly fragmented. So, um, and I think the most exciting and promising development on the horizon is the, the development of the Giant Panda National Park. Um, the main goal of the park is to improve connectivity between isolated populations and habitat for giant pandas. And that's to improve metapo metapopulation dynamics and reduce the loss of genetic diversity. So when this is uh, fully implemented, it will cover about 70% of panda habitat and 88% of all pandas. Um, it includes 81 protected areas. So that, that also includes the pre-existing ones, but it, uh, the additional protected areas are going to, as you can see here in the figure, uh, sort of um, stitch together that network of reserves. Um, yeah, however, there's some, there are some gaps in coverage and there's been some analyses showing uh, where some other um, very um, productive areas to, to conserve and to establish corridors um, would increase connectivity. And also uh, the other issue is that uh, some of these uh, reserves are um, the part under the umbrella of the national park, but they're still managed by local and regional authorities, which so, so they receive different and varying levels of protection and administration. So one of the main needs that's been identified is to integrate uh, management under a single national park system um, with the same level of protection. So. Um, so I guess in conclusion, you know, although we know that the panda is, is not out of the woods, um, there's certainly, you know, they have been downlisted, um, but there's certainly many challenges that they face. Uh, those, that includes climate change, that includes livestock disturbance, and of course, connectivity. Um, the good news is there are plans in place to, to uh, address those challenges. And we can be hopeful that, um, that we will, um, achieve the, the, the goal of continuing to recover the giant panda. Thank you. Thank you, Ram, for your talk. And now we're moving to India with uh, uh, Prachi Tati, who's in the next speaker. And um, I met uh, Prachi at um, some of the recent uh, past IBA conferences um, around the world when we could still meet together. And Prachi works on investigating connectivity among sloth bear populations in Central and Western India uh, using landscape genetic tools. And she did her, these for her PhD and postdoc in India. She currently works on connectivity conservation at WWF India. And she also coordinates the Coalition for Wildlife Corridors, which is a network of multiple NGOs working on connectivity conservation across India. There you go, Prati. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm Prachi, and I'll be talking about uh, 
connectivity amongst both their populations in two landscapes in India. One of them is the central part of India where this photo is from. Um, this was taken in one of the tiger reserves in central India and the other landscape being the western limit of um, sloth bear distribution. So this uh, map shows the distribution of sloth bears uh, 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 in the Indian sub subcontinent. Sloth bears are endemic to the Indian subcontinent um, and have lost nearly 40% of their historical range. What remains, as you can see on the map, is um, quite fragmented. What you cannot see on the map, um, and as Gary mentioned, is the high human footprint across uh, the subcontinent. If you look at this map of uh, modification of uh, terrestrial systems due to human footprint, you can see that South Asia um, is it, it comes out as a very high human modified, highly human modified uh, region, and this region faces some of the highest pressures on land, a land that is shared by wildlife and by people. Uh, Often the protected areas and wildlife habitats, including sloth bear habitats, are embedded in a matrix of human modified landscape. There are people, there are settlements, there's agriculture, there's infrastructure. And despite that, um, these, a lot of these species are able to move between habitat patches. Research on elephants and tigers um, has shown that they are able to navigate uh, through agricultural fields, through roads, can cross roads and so on. But there's little research on uh, some of the other species. And we wanted to look at how sloth bears uh, navigate through human modified landscapes. So uh, we looked at sloth bear uh, populations in two different landscapes highlighted on the map. The central part um, is, this is called the central Indian landscape. And this we're calling the Western uh, India or the Southern part of the Aravali mountain range, the Southern Aravali landscape. And this photo is from, from the Southern Aravali. So you can see there are hills um, in this landscape, which are often occupied by sloth bears, and valleys have agriculture. These, these hills are uh, mostly low-lying hills. And um, this, this landscape is um, semi-arid landscape uh, in the Western part. So what we did was we initially did carried out a study in Central India around five years back. And uh, a couple of years ago, we, we sampled this Western part of the landscape. Um, we use landscape genetic tools for both, and uh, we wanted to have a spatial replication to look at are there any common um, landscape effects that we see across different landscapes. We uh, did this work with the help of a lot of volunteers. We used a citizen science approach. Um, we worked with volunteers and the forest department on trails in the forests and collected cat samples and extracted DNA from them. Uh, the DNA extraction was done um, in a lab to identify individuals. These are the two, two landscapes. The red dot, the dots represent individual sloth bears. We had higher number of individuals for the smaller landscape uh, than, than the larger one. And in both the landscapes, we sampled both inside and outside protected areas. The black boundaries that you see on the maps are protected areas. We sampled both outside and inside uh, for both. Um, I won't go into details of, details of the method, but essentially we use genetic data as the response variable in order to understand how the different landscape features listed here, uh, land use, roads, density of linear features, impact uh, movement of sloth bears in these two different landscapes. Um, and, and also looked at some basic uh, genetic differentiation measures. This is just a quick table with, with some basics. Um, the blue and the green, uh, correspond to the two landscapes highlighted. The gray, uh, gray, gray cells are for other species, tiger, leopard, uh, jungle cat, which were also sampled in Central India. So Central India was a multi-species study just for comparison. So sloth bears have, we found them to have uh, moderate heterozygosity uh, compared to all the three cat species, uh, the heterozygosity was much lower. And genetic differentiation was also low. And this is what um, Krishna, who will be giving a talk later, um, and, and, and co-authors also found in 2015 study that they did in the same landscape in Central India, moderate heterozygosity and low genetic differentiation with populations being connected. And then we wanted to look at how landscape features impact genetic differentiation. Um, and in the two different landscapes, we found the results were not very consistent. 
Um, this lower landscape is Central India, where uh, genetic differentiation was low, and the landscape effects were also low. So both these maps are resistant surfaces or cost surfaces, where uh, darker colors indicate high resistance or high costs associated with moving through these areas. And lighter colors represent low cost associated with moving through these areas. So for, for the Central India landscape, which is the lower one, um, we found the landscape had very low effect with only dense human settlements or built up areas having an impact on um, sloth bear movement. But for the smaller landscape, uh, where we also had more samples, so this, this might be a contributing factor, we also had more samples and the landscape features are different. We found that it's not just human population density, but it is also the density of linear features that had a strong impact. And as you can see, uh, this, this just shows the amount of variation uh, explained by the models, and that's much higher for, for the smaller landscape. So uh, essentially, the two landscapes, when we looked at how different landscape features impact movement, um, they had uh, the effects were different. And this is um, seen by a few other studies who were able to have replicate landscapes, who were able to study multiple landscape for the same species. One such study, um, was in North America on black bears uh, that looked at 12 different landscapes and saw the effect of different landscape features on black bear movement. And they found that all these study areas had different landscape features coming up as important. So this often happens uh, because of the different distribution of, of uh, linear features, um, uh, forest, forested areas, and so on. Unfortunately, we only had two landscapes. So we couldn't carry out any formal analysis to test um, thresholds of, like, like the other study does to look at what, what is different and what could be impacting uh, the different results that we get. Um, the other thing uh, which is important for uh, both the studies is that both studies, uh, the populations had low genetic differentiation. This um, is important for any kind of landscape genetic analysis because low genetic uh, differentiation essentially, along with low effect of landscape, um, is not a very good combination to detect the impact of landscape. So the, um, the la effect, the lack of effect of landscape features of roads, of uh, agriculture on movement that we see for Central India may not be um, due to the fact that there's no effect at all. It could be because our data is not able to pick that up. That's likely because sloth bears have very high effective uh, population sites and hence uh, low genetic differentiation. But what we do see and what, uh, we, we, uh, what we do see is there are a lot of sloth bears outside protected areas. And these sloth bears seem to contribute to maintaining connectivity between protected areas. And we did quick simulations to test this. What if the populations outside protected areas disappear. And we see that the populations on either side um, of the uh, uh, corridor or connectivity space have become highly genetically differentiated. Some of them also go extinct. These results have not been included that was presented um, in a previous conference. But uh, so, so these individuals outside protected areas contribute disproportionately to maintaining uh, connectivity across these landscapes and the low genetic differentiation. And this, this, this uh, figure just shows um, how many, just, just, just shows the number of sloth bears outside protected areas. So these are, this is again, another study from central India. These are two protected areas, Kanha Tiger Reserve and Page Tiger Reserve. And this is the corridor in between. There's no protected area here. And these red dots are villages with sloth bear conflict cases uh, based on interview surveys and first department records. So, if you look at the sloth bear distribution outside protected areas and in tiger corridors, this is a known tiger corridor. Uh, you can see how much effect they are likely to have on maintaining connectivity between these uh, two areas. And all these areas are shared spaces. There are villages, there are people, there are settlements um, in, in the same area. So this has implications for um, conservation planning beyond uh, it being just uh, a tiger corridor. So it's not just for movement, but there are less than sloth, bear, uh, sloth bears in this in these corridors. So this, this um, based on, on, on all the information that we have on sloth bear connectivity and the fact that there are a lot of sloth bears in other corridors, using all this um, in a project that we are currently doing, uh, which is a part of 
the Coalition for Wildlife Corridors that Gary also mentioned. Um, it's a network of uh, NGOs, uh, 10 right now, that work on connectivity uh, conservation that have different strengths. And one of the things that we are doing together um, as a group are we are developing profiles for corridors, including profiles for sloth bear corridors. And for that, we have also reached out to a few other NGOs working specifically on sloth bears who will soon be a part of uh, this network. Um, and along with documenting the current use and the status, we plan to create a database of uh, profiles that will be up on the website uh, in the near future. So thank you. Um, for, for your attention. This, this um, Western landscape study was funded by the International Bear Association. The work was carried out at NCBS and now uh, the Coalition for Wildlife Corridors is something I'm doing with WWF. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prachi. And the next speaker is uh, Trishna Datta. I know Trishna very well because I work with her um, within the Bear Connect project that we have to work on, on connectivity for brown bears in Europe. And um, Trishna is currently based at the University of Göttingen in Germany. In Germany. Her bear research spans questions on evaluating functional connectivity for sloth bears in central India and also for brown bears in Europe. Uh, but she also addressed questions on uh, population monitoring and ecology of brown bears in the Himalaya. And there you go, Trishna. Thanks, Marta. Let's see if... And we I are, I think we're a little bit ahead of time, so don't stress about the, like, if it's not, and take your time. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me get rid of everyone else here. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, an approach to identify species for connectivity conservation. This has been brought up both by Gary and Mike uh, about using um, species for uh, as, as systems to uh, model connectivity. And um, I'd like to start by thanking all my co-authors. So um, I picked up on the umbrella species because it's uh, a very well-known concept in conservation. The idea basically is that by conserving a particular species that usually is specific in its habitat requirements, usually requires a large area and overlaps with the number of species, we can actually protect and conserve um, a, a number of uh, species that co-occur with the single species. It's been widely used to set aside uh, priority habitats for conservation, delineate, for example, protected areas, uh, and it's been quite successful on that um, application part of it. But uh, using the same concept for um, connectivity conservation, is it's not a one-is-to-one -one application, because unlike this uh, concept, which is built upon um, identifying the best and core, you know, the core uh, patches uh, that a species requires, during dispersal, animals are much less selective and can actually persist and move through areas that are suboptimal. So. So, I mean, this is, not, um, this is not a new problem. People have thought about this and they've published papers on this. Um, and it seems to work with a few caveats. Uh, some of the lessons we've learned is that a multi-species approach, like some of the previous speakers have said, is a much better approach at getting to con connectivity conservation goals than using a single species. So uh, just as an example, this is on the left, you see uh, the wildcat. This is um, a connectivity species, you know, umbrella species for Germany. And the brown bear, of course, is used for in the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, system. And as far as I know, it's these species have been selected um, a priori without testing uh, all the other species that, for example, co occur with it to see whether or not these would actually be good uh, species for uh, as surrogates uh, for connectivity conservation. So uh, I, this is a pretty important question because if we do not uh, select the right species, we might be um, spending our conservation efforts on a species which might not get us to uh, the goals that we want to actually get at. 
So I asked a very simple question, um, which species and how many species do we need for connectivity conservation? And how, how can we select these species? So I used an example, I, I did this uh, for continental Europe and I simulated connectivity for 24 different species. These are all uh, large terrestrial mammals, and large meaning anything more than three kilograms based on some paper that was previously published. Um, and I won't go into the details. And I, I think going a little later in the session is really nice because some of the previous speakers has, have covered a lot of this, these concepts. So I won't get into it for, at all. But basically we start with the resistance surface. And for this, I used previously published habitat suitability maps for all of these species and converted them into a resistance surface, uh, selected protected areas, which would be the nodes for analysis. And finally, simulated connectivity. I use a tool called LS Corridors. And what you're seeing in the background is a resistance map with lighter, sorry, darker blue colors being low resistance and towards brown being really high resistance. The two polygons you see here are two protected areas that we're interested in connecting. So what I did was between each pair of, of sites for every single species, I ran 50 simulations. And what you get at the end is um, a raster, which tells you the number of times every pixel uh, was selected as a corridor cell, as a connectivity cell. And so when you do this across, you know, multiple different pairs of, of source and targets, and you do this for multiple species, what you get at the end is something like this. Um, the higher, uh, the darker blue and purple colors show areas of higher probability of connectivity. Um, and the lower colors show uh, a lesser uh, selection frequency. Um, two things that are important to note here, and I will refer to in the next slides, are the scale of analysis. I did this at two levels, what I call biomes and ecoregions. Uh, biomes have a specific definition in terms of um, uh, ecology and biogeography. But he, what I did here is divide Europe into geographic regions by the, penin the, you know, the major peninsulas and selected the biomes within these geographic regions. But I just call them biomes and ecoregions, and basically ecoregions are nested within biomes. So there are two scales, one coarse and one slightly finer. So um, the concept um, of how you would do this um, is it's pretty simple. Let's consider you have a region. This is the yellow square or rectangle, and you have this giant blob. This is, say, your connectivity goal. This is what you want to get at. And what you start doing is you start adding the network of every single species. So you add the one for the red and you see how much of the target it covers. And you keep doing this until you hit an asymptote of whatever it is that you need. And depending on that, it's three species with these blue, green, and brown color or uh, something else. To do this, you need to rank the species because which goes into this plot first is important. And so normally what you do is uh, select the number of species that a reference species overlaps with and the mean overlapping area. This is the usually the two criteria that are used. Uh, I added some more uh, qualitative as well as quantitative uh, criteria to rank the species. And I can go over them if you have questions at the end, but basically they look at both, not just how much area and how many species they overlap, but also the, the quality of these overlaps. So we are looking at volumetric intersections. So what we find is that um, there is no shortcut and you cannot have this one species for uh, every place. Obviously it matters where you are geographically. Um, so depending upon where you are, one thing, uh, there's a lot of species silhouettes here. One message that I want you to take from here is that uh, for most uh, regions, um, you have more than one species that are required. So this kind of confirms some of the previous um, talks and some of the previous results that have come out that multi-species approaches are actually uh, proving to be better than single species. This is the result for the biomes. And in 92% of the biomes, we found more than one species being selected as connectivity umbrellas. Um, there is scale dependency in how many species. So on the x-axis here is the number of species selected as connectivity umbrellas. And on the y-axis are these different biomes. The larger circles here are the number of species selected at the biome level. The smaller ones are uh, species selected at the ecoregion level. 
And what you can see here is that uh, at the biome level, so at the coarser scale, you need more species and at an ecoregion scale, so at a finer level, you need fewer species. On an average, uh, 4.15 species were selected at the biome level and about 3.16 for uh, the ecoregions. But it's not just how many species, which species also differs. So for example, in this, uh, you know, this big chunk of landmass in, in Europe, in Central Europe, you can see uh, there's six different species selected. But if you look at the ecoregions, uh, you'll see that a different set of species emerges as connectivity umbrellas. And what's important to see is that uh, it's not just a subset of what you had selected at the biome scale. So the species actually change quite a bit. So you will have different sets of surrogate species that will be um, um, more representative for uh, your area of interest. Um, brown bears and um, the lynx is highlighted in, in black here because these are species of conservation concern in the ecoregion level, but they are not um, listed um, in higher threat categories in, in the biome level. So I wanted to see whether or not the landscape um, matters. And so what I did is I did a cluster analysis of habitat fragmentation and human footprint uh, across all the different ecoregions. And what I found was five clusters uh, and number one meaning the, the northern regions with the lowest overall human influence and five meaning really high influence. And these are usually in the south. So what I found is that um, species that were selected as connectivity umbrella shown in, in the blue here um, are different from the species that are not selected as uh, the non-umbrella, so yeah, not selected. So the non-umbrella species, which is in, in red. And the, the bar is just showing the average of this particular trait, which is body mass across the entire cluster. And what you can see here is that a higher um, uh, in, in regions with in clusters with less human or less human influence overall, uh, species with a higher body mass are selected uh, in these regions. I did this for a bunch of different uh, characteristics. We won't go through all of them, but to summarize, in regions with low human influence, we found that these connectivity umbrellas have a higher body mass, larger home range higher conservation, um, cons uh, have a higher conservation concern, move or disperse over longer distances. Proportionally, more species are required as connectivity umbrellas in regions of high human influence. Oops, suddenly stopped working. Okay, uh, I won't get into the details of this, but we also tested, if you remember this giant black blob, what that blob would be. We created three different targets and um, we tested it. Um, what's important here to see is that the targets look different and thank, you know, um, not thankfully, but as you would expect, the number of species and, uh, and the actual identity of species also differs by uh, what your target is. Um, brown bears uh, show up as connectivity umbrellas in four different regions across their range. This is, um, you know, in the, in the yellows are the range and in the reds are ecoregions where they were selected as uh, connectivity umbrellas. Um, I've highlighted the Carpathians in blue because they, are, they rank number two and this is the only region where the wolf is on its own uh, a good connectivity umbrella, but they're pretty close up there. But this is not the goal. I showed this because this is the IBA conference, um, but this is not the goal. And I want to make sure that everyone gets this. This is not prescriptive, it's an approach. Uh, and the whole goal is to come up with a more quantitative objective approach to figure out which species would be good uh, as surrogates for connectivity conservation. So um, to wrap up, um, I show that uh, it is indeed uh, possible to objectively select um, species for for connectivity conservation. Uh, single species solutions are inadequate and it reconfirms uh, a lot of previous research. And both the number and identity of species are sensitive to the scale of analysis, the connectivity target, and also the underlying landscape. And this last bit is important because usually we select a species and say, ah, I think this will be a good um, species for connectivity and we just use it in all the different uh, regions, which I don't think, uh, would be the best way to go about it. So with that, uh, I thank everyone who's helped me, especially early on. 
And yeah, I will take questions when it's time for questions. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, Trishna. That was an excellent talk. There's a nice theme going here of expanding beyond uh, one species. Uh, that was a very nice uh, addition to the, that idea. Uh, next up is our final speaker and uh, Marta de Barba. And uh, she's worked as a research conservationist for over 20 years in Italy, France, US. Now she's in Slovenia. Uh, she did a PhD at the US at the University of Idaho with Lizette Waits. Uh, and she's also worked for nine years at the Pierre Taberlet lab. That's where uh, I was very impressed. He's a premier population geneticist on the earth, I think. And now she's joined the Tomas uh, Scribinix. Uh, sorry, Tomas. <laughs> I love you and I've been on your sailboat in the Adriatic Sea, but I did not learn how to pronounce your name. I apologize, but he's uh, she's working in that lab in Slovenia. Uh, she's also, in 2017, became the coordinator of Bear Connect, which is a, a European-wide con connectivity project across. Uh, with, Marta also came and trapped bears with me for a summer in a few years back, and we sat around the truck hashing ideas for, for these large landscape uh, projects. It's pretty cool that they pulled that together. And um, uh, she started her PhD a long time ago, as she mentioned, when she introduced me, and I've known her ever since. And, you know, she was a little beginner, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but now, uh, all those years later, she knows so much more about population genetics and genetic tools for ecology than I ever did. Uh, so I've become very impressed of watching her grow into this very mature superstar. So and with that, Marta, um, Thank you. And I hope your Zoom doesn't crash. You've been having a few computer problems today. So good luck. We're all praying for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your introduction and for your pray for my Zoom. And in fact, I should probably just give uh, a warning to everybody that my uh, Zoom just crashed twice over this session, but um, seems that it was able to restart and reconnect right away. So if that happens, I that's what I'll do. I'll reconnect and I'll restart from where I left. We are a few minutes ahead of time, so hopefully everything um, will will uh, work um, anyway. So um, what I will be talking today is about large scale collaboration, and I will do it by giving the example of what we've been doing for working on connectivity for brown bears in Europe with a large scale collaborative project. And today we heard about many interesting um, talks uh, and studies of bear uh, connectivity in different parts of the world. And these studies are absolutely necessary because they provide the fine scale insights um, for addressing connectivity issues on the ground. But we also need to work at a different larger scale. Okay. And um, in fact, often we um, work to support intrapopulation connectivity, often work in working within single countries. Uh, we've been definitely um, become better at working transboundary um, at also at a larger meta population level, but much less often we work at um, what is a, a much larger scale, what I call here the landscape scale, uh, which could, for example, correspond to the historical range of a species at the continental level. Working at the landscape scale is very important, especially today that we are observing range shift and expansion for many species due to the pressure of global changes. We could also go beyond that and work um, cross scales to integrate connectivity conservation efforts from the smaller local scale to the larger landscape scale. And this is uh, particularly important because ecological processes underlying connectivity operate at different scales. Um, taking these um, large scale integrated approach, of course, have 
many benefits for uh, connectivity science and conservation. And here I just listed some to give a few examples. They span from identifying long distance movements and factors influencing connectivity at different scales uh, uh, and in different landscapes. Uh, this approach can provide also greater prediction power to identify um, key areas to manage for connectivity in the future. And it also allows to cope with scarce or missing data to make inferences at landscape scale. And of course, this is all very important for better informing um, connectivity conservation policies and landscape management. But we also know that working large scale in such an integrated way is very difficult. Um, and uh, all the difficulties uh, relate to the overall complexity of um, how we work to collect and use the data with many different actors involved um, that collect many different data types using different uh, methods and analytical approaches. Actors are driven in their data collection by different priorities and perceive different benefits for collecting their data. And priorities often um, are dictated from above and they are for um, data needs at the local, um, national and population uh, levels. And this creates uh, the fragmented picture of the data collection process that we are used to. And today what I'll talk about is how we dealt with some of this complexity um, in the context of the uh, Bear Connect project for working on brown bear connectivity in Europe. In Europe, there are 10 brown bear populations, eight of um, which are transboundary, and connectivity conservation has been recognized as a priority action for all of the populations. And we address this topic within our Bear Connect project by merging different data types, uh, occurrence, GPS, telemetry, and microsatellite genotype data for all of the 10 uh, populations in Europe. Uh, before even starting to work with the data, we had to connect to the bear people uh, and bringing the bear people together. This was crucial for the project, and but it was also very uh, time um, extensive, uh, time consuming, and uh, and was an engaging effort because um, it entailed um, exchanging, coordinating, and communicating with all the different groups that work with the brown bears in Europe. And we did this through workshop where we presented the project, but workshops were particularly important also for discovering available bear data because often the valuable data that we collect for bears remain hidden to the broader uh, conservation community and cannot even be exploited, cannot even be utilized. Then we set up procedures for um, regulating the use of the data by the project and uh, corresponded a lot with uh, the um, data providers for gathering and curating the data, for compiling the metadata and for providing updates. Then connecting the bare data involved several set steps after data gathering that entailed curation, standardization, archival management, and integration of the different data sets. Also compilation of the metadata was important to have all the documentation necessary for us to correctly interpret and use the data. And of course, then all of the steps um, for ensuring data quality. Gathering the data took us uh, about two and a half years. And uh, um, after that, data standardization was a particularly complex and time consuming um, step because it went from standardizing uh, of basic text formatting and GPS coordinates to standardization of information content because, of course, every group was using different terminology for indicating um, bear categories or sampling methods and, and approaches. Then we verified um, inaccurate information and, when possible, tried to retrieve missing information. 
Um, all the data are now stored in a centralized database infrastructure. It was crucial to have a database manager that took care of all of the steps from um, entering, curating, and standardizing the data. And of course, a very important aspect is ensuring long-term maintenance of such an infrastructure. Um, we have now stored in this database over um, 80 data sets for all of the populations in Europe, data that were provided by more than 40 research groups. And these data are now being used for different aspects of connectivity analysis for the brown bear in Europe. Um, compilation, curation, and standardization of, of all of these three data sets had its uh, own specific challenges. Uh, but I'm here just going to mention some of the challenges we had for um, dealing with the genetic data. Um, the genetic data set was comprised by data on 28 standard microsatellite loci used across all the populations in Europe. But the striking thing was that uh, there was no single locus that was common across all of the data sets. And as you can imagine, these prevent at start um, common analysis at the population level. So we had to come up with an alternative strategy to um, analyze the data. Another issue um, or things that we anyway had to deal with is that genotype data and microsatellites, as you know, is not directly comparable among labs and these but a calibration step is required. And um, these involved, um, this calibration process step involved a lot of coordination with the 13 genetic labs uh, um, collaborating with us for uh, doing and validating the calibration that um, entailed both manual and automated checking, reanalysis sometimes of the calibration samples, and also sometimes a recalling of a, alleles and genotypes in the original data set. So as you can imagine, that was quite of an intensive and engaged process, not just for us, but also from the data providers that were uh, very much willing to cooperate with us and, and worked with us on these um, since the beginning. Um, we learned a lot from the whole, all the, this whole process. Of course, it was technically challenging and time consuming more than we predicted in the beginning when we went into this. Um, dedicated personnel is absolutely needed, but it's needed on both sides, um, not just on the side of the centralized database, but optimally also on the side of the data providers to ensure, uh, to work with us and to ensure that we can understand the data that they, they are providing. Also, infrastructures are needed, of course, for storing the data, such as the database, but optimally also for supporting the networking between um, the data providers or anyway, the different stakeholders involved, and also for providing technical support uh, to um, preparing and providing the data for these such large scale projects. Of course, all these would be optimally be supported by long-term and even better permanent funding that's often are the limiting factor for this such a large scale long-term projects. Um, and without saying that we couldn't have uh, done this at all without the willingness to cooperate of from all the bear groups that worked with us uh, since the beginning um, of the project. Um, these type of challenges are common, not just to our project, but are common to um, also many other large scale projects in other areas of conservation, not just connectivity. And they all relate to the complexity, this figure that I showed in the beginning. Um, in um, our Bear Connect project, we worked uh, uh, through the part of the complexity that arises directly from the methodological heterogeneity in the data. But if we want to think uh, in, in the future and make things easier uh, in the future to do these large scale integrated project, we also need to work on other levels of the complexity. We need to work on the priorities and the benefits 
that need to be reconsidered in order to reduce this fragmentation. Priorities, as I said, are often dictated from above. So governments will play an important role in uh, providing uh, mechanisms uh, necessary for supporting um, large-scale collaborative efforts necessary for um, integrating data from multiple sources or, for example, standardizing collection protocols across large scales. But uh, we, as the community of data providers and users, also need to um, gain greater awareness of the value of working together uh, and using our collective data. Um, need to gain um, a data stewardship and integration mindset and proactively engage in collaborative large scale projects. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And of course, I am um, thankful to all of the funding agency, the agencies that supported our project over the past years, and to the several people working within the various bear groups in Europe that uh, provided their support to our project and provided their data for the project. And um, with this, I think we're moving to the discussion session and um, we'll be ready to take, uh, to take questions. Um, uh, you can unshare your screen, Marta. Thank you very much. That was excellent. It was a great suite of speakers. Thanks all to you speakers. Uh, um, now we're gonna move to the discussion period uh, uh, and we have uh, questions and answers have been written in and I encourage you to write in on the attendee hub question and answers. And, uh, I'm going to uh, cheat here a little bit. I've read through some of the questions, Marta, while you were speaking. I apologize. Okay. For <laughs> and I, I have a question for Gary, and it's also asked a similar question by uh, Sandeep Sharma. And yeah. so I'm just going to start there. Mike, uh, because just, you are, a, Mike just a thing. I wanted to remind people first that um, in this discussion question, people are Welcome to um, direct their question directly to the speakers, but the discussion question is also meant to be broad and bring up any uh, connectivity issues that we wanted to discuss or any aspect or any general question you have on, on connectivity. So both things are welcome. You can uh, have direct questions to the speakers and to their talk, but also like we wanna, we wanna engage in a also broader discussion. That's it. Yeah, perfect, Marta. I forgot to say that. And this this talk, this question is a little broader than that. And um, one of the issues I've had, and Sandeep is saying, a uh, very inspiring talk, Gary. My question is about political will, which is the which is the major missing component of conservation in many developing countries. Could you please suggest some effective ways to garner political will for conservation? And more specifically, in my area, I'm having a hard time translating. We have some really solid science, but to, to make it an officially designated, recognized corridor is challenging. Do you have some tips and advice and sage wisdom on this? Yeah. Oh boy, that's a loaded no pressure. question. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Okay, here's the, here's the secret sauce of political will. Competition. The, uh, the, the ability of not to look bad in, in, in face of your peers. If you have a, you just got it. You just got to hit one of the dominoes. If you get a, a country to take the lead and show that they're doing great, it has a diffuse effect on other jurisdictions. For instance, when Tanzania decided to have a national wildlife corridor policy, and believe me, you know there's a lot of policy that has no teeth. The Kenyans got very concerned that they were going to be left behind and not having a National Wildlife Corridor Act. This, and this can be played out in so many different jurisdictions, subnationally, between nations, and globally. So that's the way to do it. it. It requires some leadership in some geography, but when it happens, it's funny how fast things move. Well, it's, it sounds like that it is happening in some jurisdictions, so we should just all look to our nearest jurisdiction that's ahead of us. Exactly. I mean, that's, and people, it, it's amazing how much that, that, that social incentive plays a role in this kind of change. So, so yes, leadership matters. And, and, you know, and 
I just want to step back. You know, China's leading on the idea of eco civilization. You know, and I think you know other countries are looking at what that means, and what kind of policies it have. You know, it, it has. So even though we we might look at uh, various countries in critical ways, there's some leadership on this issue. So yeah. I mean, it, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to one little corollary, and then we'll open it up to other ideas. Was the, I also have trouble with uh, jurisdictionally the link between in, in North America anyway, private and public lands. So governments don't want to, you know, they claim they don't have any power over private lands. Is there a way that you bridge? Because you mentioned that earlier in your talk, bridging private lands and public lands, because often connectivity corridors are through private lands. Well, if, if for any of the folks who work in Africa will know. The future of conservation in Africa is on private lands. And to have policies that create private reserves, con conservancies, a lot, you know, the conservancy movement is very big in Africa, where there is legal, truly legal protections for private lands. A lot of it is sometimes uh, tax incentives are, are related to this, uh, some kind of income streams are related, or, or, or permits or concessions to do certain businesses. There are ways to have this kind of protection. We are, the protected area toolbox is great. We love it, but my God, you know, there's so many other ways to protect lands and seas that we've, you know, we've, we're just getting into here. And connectivity is really one of the key incentives to have these kind of new innovative techniques. And we can turn to some of your web pages that you talked about to find some more specific tools, just as a oh, general. I for all of their, all our listeners now and me and everybody, it'd be nice to plug into that, that expertise and share the, what you guys have learned around the world. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, so many efforts, you know, to protect bear corridors have used these kind of techniques already. So, I mean, it's, um, th this community has actually, you know, facilitated some of that innovation, but yes, I mean, we do have a lot of that information in the IUCN guidelines. And Marta, I guess we'll just peruse the questions from yeah. the question and answer period, maybe. Yeah, um, I saw um, I, I saw a question from Julia that, yeah. um, first of all, she, what 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 did you want to say, Mike, something? Oh, uh, go ahead. Ah, okay. And first, um, Julia, I want to thank you, Gary, for remembering John Bevins. And so that, and then she has a question. Um, and she says, to what extent are bears a great focal species for your connectivity effort? And I would want to add to that by maybe involving also the other, the other speakers for our session um, to make them think whether bears are good um, connectivity umbrella species for their study area, or if um efforts should be made to um consider also other species uh while we work on connectivity maybe that it's done already and uh, maybe maybe we can give us some you can give us some insight on that well well thank you first of all Julia. that that uh, i'm glad to connect um and thank you for that um uh and i think i think john would be very Happy to see me, you know, speaking in, a, in an audience like this. Okay, so with regards to whether bears, I mean, as Krishna said, the, um, you know, the uh, grizzly bear, brown bear has been such a big umbrella um, for connectivity and large landscape conservation, led by the work for, like Mike Proctor, uh, you know, and many of his colleagues here in North America. I mean, the grizzly bear. Uh, has been such a, a key umbrella species. And I think that's kind of led the movement and the kind of science that, that Trishna, um, you know, talked about um, earlier. The issue that I find with bears is also that it could get perverse. And that is people thinking, well, if bears are the umbrella species, all they have to do is that they don't have to walk, they can be trucked. So we can just, we can just cart them around and, you know, and, uh, and, and do high level wildlife manipulation like in fenced reserved areas in South Africa. And I think that's really a problematic element of getting around the problem. Mm. <laughs> so just, you know, there's a, ca a cautionary tale there. Hmm. 
I agree wholeheartedly on that. I, I find uh, sometimes we use grizzly bears as an umbrella. We manage them too finely. I often argue that we shouldn't manage them too finely. We should do it in a broader way that, that allows all the other species to come along with them. I get annoyed sometimes when we, we know exactly what we need to save a bear, but then we forget the other thing. Uh, I had a question in this vein for Ron. Uh, I don't know if you put you on the spot here, if you had any advice from some of the uh, approaches they're using in China to creating a national park around panda connectivity. That's a kind of an impressive idea. I don't know. Are we going to do that for sloth bears in India next? Or uh, I know they have a completely different political system. I just wonder right. if there's something we can learn from that. Well, uh, certainly having a, um, a government government authority that um, can implement something like this is a is a huge advantage, um, as as has been throughout uh, some many of the, the processes that have been implemented over the last few decades. The establishment of 67 reserves. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been, you know, there had, the dynamic between uh, the scientist and the government <clears throat> has been particularly productive as well. There's, uh, in recent, a couple of years, you know, the proposal rolled out and then, you know, several scientists, you know, did some analyses of connectivity and gaps and, and have, um, you know, it hasn't been a whole scale change in the approach, but it's, you know, been, a, you know, some tweaking of, of, you know, where the, the, the park boundary should be established, how they should be uh, managed and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, and it's, I think it, it may be in some cases difficult to import the approach there to, to other countries that um, don't have the, the, as much political authority to, to, to do the kinds of things that they're doing. It does involve, it has involved and will involve relocation of, of human uh, settlements as well, um, and, and restitution for for the impacts that it has on the people that are relocated. So, so it's a big it's a big hairy ordeal. Um, so, I, it, I don't know. Maybe some of the other folks working with other species might be able to comment on 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 whether. Um, I, mean, I think the general approach um, could be there could be some commonalities there, but uh, the implementation across across many different political boundaries with different political systems, I, I would think it would get much more challenging. Well, I think the, the maybe a common theme and I, what I picked up in that was the, the bringing together of the scientists and the government decision makers. It reflects what they were talking about yesterday in the plenary. One of the successes in the US is the, the IGBC has brought the scientists into the same room and the scientists are talking to the decision makers. How's that going, Prachi? Are you able to functionally discuss your science with the uh, political powers that be in India? <laughs> Sorry to <laughs> put you on the spot. But, uh, well, uh, protected area around connectivity of pandas sounds great. Uh, in India, I think anything that can happen will only happen, uh, uh, something like that will be at a very small scale. With the Coalition for Wildlife Corridors, we are hoping to engage with the government but as the, as the question that Sandeep asked, the, the political will to um, engage in conversation around conservation and that too outside protected areas, where there are a lot of people in India. Um, so that, that's going to be difficult. That's a challenge we hope to tackle together. No answers right now, but that's, that's the hope. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, while we're talking about China, Ron, there's a question for you in the box here about uh, how do you think uh, working on panda conservation, will there be any overflow for Asiatic black bears or is there enough uh, overlap or maybe just in the process and implementation? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Um, and there was an analysis published recently um, is the, the panda as an umbrella species. Mm -hmm. um, and earlier, earlier work showed that it you know, actually is quite a good umbrella species because it does, it does uh, the, the 67 reserves um, has protected um, one of the most biodiverse temperate regions of the world um, and many of the species there. However, you know, pandas are probably the, the least mobile bear species. They have you know, smaller home ranges you know, they don't have any, any sort of large migratory movements. Um, they have an elevational migration of, you know, a few hundred meters every winter and, and summer. So um, it, it's not, 
it, it is, uh, it's less effective at, at uh, protecting, the system has been less effective at protecting the large carnivores, including Asiatic black bears. Um, and also uh, black bears have, um, you know, there's other issues other than just habitat. Um, you know, there are, there's the, the, the bear bile and, um, you know, other, there's, there's, there's more poaching pressure on that species. So I do think it certainly provides a foundation for protection of Asiatic black bears and other larger carnivores, but it's not sufficient. So I think it's like some of the other analyses we've heard today. You know, you, you can't build an entire protected area system on the back of a single species. It's a really good start, but it's not enough. Yeah. yeah. That excellent question was from Elizabeth Davis. So I give her credit for stimulating a good concept. Uh, here's one for uh, Trishna, just so she doesn't feel left out, put her on the spot here. Uh, I've lost it. It's, it'll come back. Uh, it's in the beginning. And uh, do you, Trishna, do you uh, use the same environmental variables to model resistance for all the target species? So that's a technical question. Does it matter if they are the same or they, if they're different? Uh, Mariella Gonchoff is a technical person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, I actually used, I actually used the same. Um, uh, I built all the resistance surfaces the same way, and they uh, were built on habitat suitability maps, which were created from three layers. Uh, and this was uh, land use type, I guess, uh, elevation and distance from water. So it's a very simplified model if you think of it. And that is why I chose to do it like that so that it's same for all the different species. I haven't tested for sensitivity to the initial modeling parameters on how this would change. You know, it, it brings up a point to extend that idea when I've had a problem in my area and maybe other people can have some comments on this is we have a lot of good bear data on connectivity. And so we're trying to build multi-species models and lose focal species, but I'm having a really hard time getting data on other species. It just doesn't mm -hmm. seem to exist. So we're, combining expert opinion and what data we have. For instance, we're developing a Wolverine model based on partial good data, but no connectivity analysis. And same for mountain goats, et cetera. And um, I don't know if anybody have any suggestions. Maybe Gary, you've seen this uh, occur around the world. How do, you know, how do you make a link to other species centric biologists to bring your data together to a real data-based multi-species analysis, which is sort of my dream. And I'll often say the polar ice caps are going to melt before we get good multi-species data. So we need to start working ahead of time. That's why I've pulled together uh, expert opinion with what data we have trying to make something. But maybe you have some advice on integrating multi-species. Uh, I mean, this is, seems to be the theme of this discussion with due to Mark Trisha's uh, work. Well, one of the things before multi-species is cross-realm integration. So bringing the terrestrial and aquatic people together, they're looking at connectivity sideways. One's looking at, you know, horizontal, the other's looking at vertical and it's crazy. And I think, you know, we've had a couple workshops bringing the two um, spheres together because they're in the same landscape, but looking at different things, but looking at connectivity. And so that kind of integration, I, I, I felt it was very productive to have these cross realm kind of conversations. Um, I also found, you know, just going back to species, the Washington, the state of Washington in the U.S. and their connectivity working group that picked 16 focal species for connectivity and then tried to integrate the connectivity data across those 16 species, I, I think is still a, 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 an excellent standard. I think they elevated the bar because they didn't make it all about one species and they did try to integrate the, the behavioral needs of those others. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, you know, Mike, you're on the right track with this kind of integrated approach. Um, um, but you know, the, the, we're, we're all, we're, we're, we all talk a good game about interdisciplinarity, but doing it is, as a friend said, it's like, you know, kids playing in a, in a sandbox. They're all playing in that sandbox, but they're not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. well, you, you've described my life in the last two years uh, with our <laughs> eco connectivity uh, or Kootenai Connect. We're working with western toads, leopard frogs, screech owls, bats, 
elk, wolverine, and grizzly bears. And it does feel like I've been a, a whitewater river and I'm in a eddy and we're all swirling around in our own eddy. So it, it, it is a challenge. I don't know if anybody else has had some luck with multi, you know, Trishna, how, with all your multi-species work, is, have you been able to translate that into real life multi-species corridor estimation across Europe yet or, or adjudicating it with real good data? So no, so this, this entire thing is built on really poor data, actually. And I think that's a strength uh, because that's what we are all dealing with, like you all said. Uh, this <laughs> is presence only data, it's scanty. Some species have more data, some have less. Uh, so in some sense, it shows that even with poor quality, you know, sparse data, you can still make, I don't want to call it an educated guess, but that's what it is. I mean, we still don't know if these species are actually going to be effective connectivity umbrellas unless we have a true validation study. But at least it's better than saying, I'm going to pick this species because I think it's cool. Um, uh, I think it's at least better than what we have now. But I think the way forward would be to look at these integrative things. You know, why use poor quality data for a species that has a lot of data? Uh, you know, why, why drop the quality down for one species so that it matches basically the one species that has the least amount of data. So that I think should be the next thing to, to kind of really integrate uh, across. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Marla and I are trying to pick questions from the uh, list that continue the concert, uh, uh, yeah. talk in a thread. There's one from uh, Cecily Costello that touches on what we're here. Uh, an analysis of uh, mammals and bears as umbrella species of studies evaluated the effectiveness for protecting non-mammal species like birds and fish and amphibians. We've tried to do that a little bit in our project. We've, it turns out that Western toads are actually amazingly um, uh, a decent umbrella for amphibians. They really use a lot of the landscape from mountaintop to valley bottom and they have this crazy meta population uh, but I was just wondering if anybody else has uh, delved into, uh, you know, the smaller critters that sometimes are more uh, species at risk. Mean like I, I sage, have, mean yeah. like sage grouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Trisha, you were going to say something. I I was going to I was going to speculate here. Um, Please. That's always good science, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but some studies have suggested previously that uh, there are some other ways to do this. So there's a guild approach where you kind of classify animals by their dispersal gills and look, look at them as a group instead of individual species at all. Um, that's an interesting idea to do this kind of thing. Uh, and I think there was another paper that said uh, you can have species representing their own gill, but they actually don't perform well across different taxonomic groups. Um, and I think that may be true, but I'm not sure because like Gary said, I think this is really important to at least uh, look at terrestrial and freshwater, um, you know, rivers, lakes, uh, connectivity kind of in the same lens. But then I, I mean, I don't think you will have the same species covering everything. I think it's going to be a mix of different species that does a little bit for each, but I don't think we have like a magic species that will just be good for everything. Yeah, what, what we've done is we've turned our attention to riparian and wetland complexes in our area, just because they are very valley bottom, uh, very important and, uh, um, and also uh, high biodiversity areas. So we've almost turned to get to accommodate all the smaller species at risk just to that habitat-based approach. And it turns out that our cord, our grizzly bear corridors really overlaid some of our bigger important riparian corridors. And that sort of sewed together a lot of species at risk and it sort of blew up. We did a bunch of species at risk assessments and all of a sudden we're talking about everything and that helped our evolution to ecological corridors, but through common habitats rather than all the millions of little species there are. So, um, and if I, I mean, sage grouse, spotted owl, these have been, you know, two iconic species in, in yeah. North America yeah. that birds that have protected, you know, terrestrial species. So they, they, you know, there are, there are examples and the aquatic ecologist will tell you 
you know, certain, you know, um, invertebrates um, are, are critical indicators uh, in aquatic environments for aquatic uh, connectivity. So, you know, they have, they have uh, micro charismatic species uh, in their environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you, go ahead, Marta. No, if you wanted to add something, I was just gonna go on for, with other questions just to make yeah, sure too. that we go. We go, go Okay, there are two questions from Joe Clark. Yeah, well, I can I can pose them all together. They're about corridors again. So, um, is there a place for removing corridors, for example, pathways for bears to enter urban exurban areas? And then the other one are are there wildlife disease implications for corridors? For example concentrating dispersing animals in a corridor as opposed to more diffuse dispersing um, dispersal might increase transmission rates. So removing corridors and uh, implications uh, of wildlife disease for corridors. I'll take a quick stab. In our grizzly bear corridor identification, we found some corridors went right through big human settlement development areas because those developments are in really great bear habitat. And that was a challenge to try to, so we, we developed criteria that would eliminate them. We do not want to create a grizzly bear corridor through a bunch of uh, towns, uh, but- um, but, these, but in many areas that it's a challenge. Like if I think I you hope a lot of, uh, I mean, bears just live uh, in, in an embedded um, yes. system with humans. So yeah. it, it's really, really difficult, I guess. Yeah, the other idea, I think, maybe we step back and we use the word corridor a lot. And I actually quit using it for a couple of decades because it does, it, it inspires the idea of a hallway where animals run back and forth, but they went into linkage zones and, and linkage areas, which we use for decades. But we, we try to, I always, my corridors, I estimated, I say the bigger, the better, you know, up to 10, 20 kilometers wide, first to accommodate much of nature, but also to give bears choice and flexibility to human managers. So um, hopefully broader corridors would help uh, offset the worry of disease a little bit. Also, a lot of the disease issues are related to fragmentation, not mm -hmm. connectivity. What happens is that you've had a system that's become fragmented and then you have these disease issues within the fragments, then you reconnect the populations and then the disease, the disease system spills back into the broader landscape. That's well, where you have major problems with disease. Yeah. Well, COVID is just one um, huge um, example of, yep. um, yeah. And I, I would just add, and this is speculation on the disease issue, but. The corridor is a it's a it's a smaller area, but I don't think the density is typically higher. It's probably actually lower um, because it's it's typically not the the most suitable attractive habitat. So the animals move through fairly quickly. So um, disease wouldn't be at the top of my list of concerns. That's a very very good point. It um, is. I yeah, I just quickly and wanted to add here. Uh, although we don't have any uh, formal analysis done. But in one of the corridors um, in central India, it's a wide, big corridor, like uh, Michael was saying, 100 kilometers long, 20 kilometers wide in some parts. Um, and nobody has really looked at uh, disease transmission, and not, not the human spillover, just the wildlife disease. But there's, uh, uh, there's a study that has looked at feral dogs and the potential of uh, spreading canine distemper, which has been uh, shown to infect um, cat, wild cats as well. So they've, they've just looked at uh, abundance of wild dogs and the uh, prevalence of um, uh, canine distemper. Um, and that's quite high across the corridor. But nobody has really looked at uh, how uh, that is likely to pose a risk to the wildlife in protected areas and within the corridor versus the benefit of having this corridor for movement. Um, very little data, uh, but, and for tiger and leopards, the populations have more or less been stable across the two protected areas that this corridor connects, but the dual population, the wild dogs, Indian wild dogs, Asian wild dogs have been fluctuating and nobody has really studied them or knows. So such things, uh, possibly uh, things happening, not enough information. Hmm. 
Yeah, there's a, uh, thank you. Uh, there's a, a, a good question from Tabitha Graves here. She says, great talks, everyone. Thank you. Have, have any of you run into challenges of non-participation or even blocking development of corridors by corporations, railroad companies, utility companies, and any tips on how to circumvent that resistance? <laughs> how can you build a corporate resistance model? And <laughs> 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 well, actually, um, things are changing quickly. I mean, I know that government will is a problem these days, but science-based targets for nature are growing quickly within the corporate sector. Um, corporations are not wait are not waiting for government action. The accountants have gotten to their books and said, "You've got a risk problem here. You've got liability in not uh, addressing these issues." So right now, I mean, and the science-based targets for nature came out of the science-based targets for climate. And as companies try to address their climate footprint and biodiversity is now part of this conversation and connectivity is coming on as part of this corporate conversation. In fact, I'm having two meetings with Mars, which people th think with chocolate, but it's actually the biggest pet food company in the world, which means a lot of soybeans. So they're interested in dealing with connectivity. Now, again, when I talked to Sandeep's question earlier, you know, what drives you know, change? When one company does it, another company, Walmart's looking right over its shoulder to see what Mars is doing. And that's how this kind of change is happening. So there's, there might be some resistors out there, but I would say they are gonna be the minority soon in this conversation. Well, Gary, you're obviously more attuned and plugged into solution-based government and corporations. Uh, I deal with them a little bit. But anyway, I could see the thread in some of your advice is to uh, pit our opponents against each other a little bit, divide and conquer, and uh, competition. I like that. It's going to stick with me. <laughs> the Chinese government is creating connectivity national parks. Let's go, Canada. <laughs> Mike, so, there's a second. Question for you. Oh, I was avoiding that one, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's again, it's again by Sandeep. And answer now. Wait a second that I'm going to do that so it goes up. Um, yeah, wonderful summary of connectivity work in their world, Mike. That's what Sandeep says. Uh, connectivity studies on tropical Asian, bear, Asian bears are very few. What's um, your advice or tips to promote more connectivity research about those species? Well, I'm going to borrow uh, Gary Tabor's answer, and I'm going to say competition with other jurisdictions and... <laughs> It's always quite useful. Uh, oh my God, they've got a good Iranian connectivity model. We need one in uh, Pakistan now. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that there's some truth to that. But the other thing that, that got it going for me, um, and, you know, I started having these ideas in the late 90s, and um, it was, I was lucky because. My first project in bears was to understand the, fr the, the fragmentation landscape. So I defined the problem. And then I went kind of with my papers around and said, listen, here is the problem. And, and, and that problem uh, sort of opened the doors for a solution. I was, of course, trying to create employment for myself, but it, it, it did work. So defining the problem, um, if you, know, you can get your foot in the door and show the connectivity, uh, fragmentation, and we always talk about Connectivity, but I bring the two topics together a lot. Uh, it's always a you know fragmentation is a problem, connectivity is a solution, and and I think to um, stimulate the solution, you need to understand the problem. So those would be my two answers. Get your foot in the door, but there's enough research in Asia now, starting uh, with the, the excellent work in India and other places and across the species that we can pull those out and say, listen, we have a problem, we need to uh, fix it. But also the other thing that I've used is I, when I give a lot of talks about this, I say, listen, we're not alone in this. I'm not just telling you here to fix the problem in the Southern Canada. This is being done all over the world. Um, I've made a couple of slides that show connectivity work around the world. And I think it makes people feel like, okay, this really is a global, global problem sort of at the level of climate change. And therefore, I'm going to I'm going to join in and try to get going. And it seems to sucker people along. I mean, it seems to stimulate people 
and help them uh, get behind it. I've also found that connectivity is kind of a, I don't know for a better term, uh, it's a North American centric term, sort of mother and apple pie term, but everybody's sort of agreeable to with, with it on the scope of things. There are some conservation issues I work on that are not like closing roads for bears, access management is almost impossible, but connectivity is a very easily talked about and considered solution compared to some of the other uh, difficult ones. So I don't, hopefully Sandeep, I gave you some tips. I don't know, it's a tough one. How are we doing? Marta, are there some more questions we haven't hit? There is, I think, another one from Sandeep. Uh, just curious if there are any, what is, I don't know what he means, any red? Red what? plus. Red plus equivalent examples in connectivity world, where incentives are provided um, to the countries for creating and conserving corridors if there are any examples. Trishna, do you know what red plus means? You're married to this man. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> He's always got very good questions. He's a uh, we, you know what that Reducing means? emissions, uh, something, something. Exactly. Avoiding de yeah. deforestation. Yeah, carbon yeah. sequestration uh, yeah. measure. So yeah, the idea is that can we pony connectivity on carbon sequestration uh, goals. And I, I think any sort of yeah. forest protection and reforestation program would would fit. I'm not aware with the bear uh, mm. forest restoration that specifically, you know, uh, synergize with a red plus. Um, well, but could I we have like either. carbon I've never credits? Heard of it, but it is there, we, the Nature Conservancy Canada is one of my partners in terms of protecting private lands for conservation and particularly connectivity. We've, they've drank the Kool-Aid and they've really been helping buy uh, lands strategically identified as, as corridors for bears, but also for ecological corridors. And they have a very ambitious carbon sequestering uh, program for helping uh, fund their, their systems. Like they, A, they buy money, but also they get carbon credits and they sell them to Microsoft and everything. I've given talks to some people about it, but so there is a link there. I don't know if it's the red plus, but um, I have seen a little bit of it. I don't know, Gary, have you? So, uh, okay. So let me start about hmm. what policymakers can digest. So why we use the word corridor versus a better term like connectivity uh, conservation area. It's because corridor is now within the, the limited ecological vocabulary of policymakers. So we had to use corridor. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to this agenda, which is why I presented that Michelle Ward slide, they get 30 by 30 with a protected area. They just don't know what their target is for connectivity. They need this very imperfect but manageable target for connectivity. Do we save 30%? should all protected areas be 30% connected? They need something that simple. And so when it comes to red and getting those targets, they, need, they keep asking me and the, the connectivity conservation specialist group, just give us a target that's easily digestible. And us being, you know, the scientific community goes, no, we can't do that. No way, you know, it's too, it's too fine. Because <laughs> everybody wants perfect. And so we, we have a perfect audience in an imperfect world. <laughs> well, I appreciate your comment. I had to switch to the word corridor too because linkage area just went over everybody's head. And um, uh, yeah, the simplified solution, uh, it, it is useful, but it's annoying to us scientists for sure. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners out there Ro you know, rolling their eyes uh, as well. Um, how are we doing for time, Marta? I think we're- We have um, one minute left. There is one question just arrived. I don't know if we can try to answer. How, the, how about the communication risks related with using the needs of umbrella charismatic, far ranging, uh, but polarizing species like large carnivores, for example, bears to promote the importance of connectivity? Could it sometimes, um, still, sorry, could it sometimes cause still more polarization? 
So we go back a little bit to what we, we said before. Well, I, I'm I think all of that, these... that question, and we, I have gotten a lot of pushback for using grizzly bears as a, as a corridor, but now that I'm into uh, Western toads, it's not a problem. Trishna, you were going to respond. No, I think you were saying something more sensible. I was just going to say most of these, <laughs> most of these species are, are uh, kind of polarized. I mean, they're usually the ones we use are large carnivores yes, or herbivores, even herbivores. If you talk, think about elephants, I mean, these are all things that um, polarize people and, and cause conflict, uh, but anything can cause a conflict. So, I mean, that's that's why Mike's term sex across the highways I think is a big selling point <laughs> it is and you know I was only been quoted in the New York Times once in my life and it happened to be I said that uh, with a New York you were there a New York Times guy what a what a quote to start my career sex across the highway but uh, but you know it, it's a good point though because grizzly bears it can also be dangerous and people get hurt by grizzly bears and we have this risk factor which I tried to gloss over in my talk about you know, we're encouraging grizzly bear corridors Mike, through human I, environments. We're getting warning messages that we need to close the session. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so we're, we're thanks everybody done. for participating. Yeah. Thanks to the speakers and thank to the everyone. audience and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thank you very much, all you speakers. It was terrific. Thank you. Excellent discussion. Bye. Bye.